most of the students that come to our PDC courses are really in this wonderful, interesting time in their lives where they're right on the edge of deciding what they want for their life. They've done college or most of their college life, then maybe they've entered into a career, and they're, they're just thinking, this isn't really doing it for me. And as far as I'm seeing from the world, it's not gonna get any better. So they're, they're looking for an alternative. They're looking for a way to change what's gonna play out in their lives. They're, trying to, they're starting to take it in their own hands. to learn Theravada Buddhism and permaculture. While I care about nutrition and health care, I have a bigger concern about conservation and sustainability. Um, what we're doing right now isn't working. We um, stopped farming because the land was no good and want it to be a real family thing like it was with my grandfather and my great-grandfather. are becoming less and less self-sufficient around the world. These local communities that were previously uh, growing everything themselves and knew how to build their own houses out of natural materials are completely dependent on uh, big foreign powers and imports from other countries. So I guess I've, I've grew up around heaps of trees and the rainforest and animals and I've always had that connection with nature and so if I'm away from it I feel like something's missing and so that's what brought me here was to learn about a new culture and learn about the different kind of environments and habitat. And, challenges that permaculture has out in front of it is proving to the world that it can be a viable form of profitable agriculture. Through the development of a master plan um, for your site or your project, it's possible to really lay out enhancement strategies that make it more likely that you and your project can become profitable.
most important aspects to our ecological farm here is the, the making of compost, about improving the soil and constantly bringing more organic matter and more life into the soil. The compost production process is actually really easy and it's accessible to anyone. It doesn't take expensive parts. It doesn't take without much space. All you need are three simple ingredients and those ingredients can come from any number of sources. We're gonna use brown matter, which on this farm, we use corn husks for because they, they produced a bunch of corn at this farm and this was kind of tossed aside to be used later. So using corn husks is our brown matter. It's gonna be the high carbon component of our compost pile. Then we need green matter. You're looking for green uh, leafy matter. The, the green color in the leaf indicates that there's still quite a bit of nitrogen left in it. Uh, if I was to leave this out in the sun, after a couple days, it would turn brown, and that's indicating that the nitrogen has been lost into the atmosphere. Um, so we wanna cut it fresh, use it fresh in our compost pile. Um, we just had a bunch of weeds around our farm, and this morning we went out and, and collected them up and put them in a big pile. And as we add it to the compost pile, we're gonna chop it into little bits. Uh, we also have a bunch of food scraps from the kitchen that we're gonna layer into the pile as well. And that also is considered part of our green uh, component. For the uh, nitrogen component of the compost pile, uh, generally um, we use manure in the pile. You can get away with using the, the greens from legume plants because they're also high, high in nitrogen. Um, but we're gonna use, in our local area, there's lots of cows around, so we just went to some local farmers and got their manure from them. And so we're just using some manure out of their, out of their, uh, their cow yards. So we'll layer this in along with the green and the brown and uh, add, add moisture and oxygen and uh, that'll make our compost pile. Um, all the different countries represented, um, the place can reach some kind of uh, resilience. Uh, another important component to our compost pile is an inoculum of uh, microorganisms from the previous compost pile. So we're gonna take some high quality compost that we produced previously and sprinkle it into our pile as we're making the layers. That way all the bacterial life, all the fung fungal life and the microorganisms that are thriving in this pile will be added to that pile and will start to just flourish as we create the right, the right conditions. This is gonna make the, our new compost pile beautiful and wonderful for our site. All right, when we go to build our compost piles, we need to get the correct proportions of our different components. What we're looking for is a 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio in our pile. Generally, we do it based on recipes and then adjust your pile as you go. So one of the most common recipes is a 40% brown matter, 40% green matter, and 20% high nitrogen. So then you layer those in your pile, watering it pretty heavily the entire time, and then let it sit. Now, depending on what materials you're using, you're gonna have to adjust that. So what you're gonna need to do is build your pile with the materials you have readily available to you in your area, and then see how it goes. If the pile gets too hot, which we often experience here in the tropics because the microbes are so active and so ready to, to do their job, that, that means we have too much nitrogen in the pile. So when you, when you go to turn the pile, um, it, we should mix in a little bit more carbon matter. That can be sawdust, that can be strips of paper, and that can be our corn husks that we're using here. If your pile is not really doing anything, it's not really getting hot, it doesn't seem to be breaking down, um, that means you don't have enough nitrogen. So basically get a little bit more manure or a little bit more of your legume greens and mix those in as you're turning the pile. If, you're, if your pile just smells completely like sewage, if it just smells like, then that's a sign that it's going anaerobic, which means you don't have enough oxygen in the pile. It's really important that we don't allow the compost pile to go anaerobic. So the best method for that is to acquire a compost thermometer and watch the temperature of the pile. We wanna watch, watch the temperature going up to about 65 degrees Celsius. At 65 degrees Celsius, then we wanna turn the pile, 
get more air into it, and allow it to go through its process again. If the pile gets to 70 degrees Celsius, it's gonna start killing beneficial, beneficial microbial life. There's two main reasons why that would happen. One is that the pile is too wet, which means you just need to add more dry material or spread the pile out a little bit and let it dry out. The other reason why it might be going anaerobic is that you have too much nitrogen. And so the nitrogen is reacting a lot and eating up all the oxygen really quickly before it can re-aerate itself. So really important to keep our piles as an aerated pile. So with those tricks and over a couple of times of trying it, you should become really comfortable at making a really high quality compost. Oh yeah, there's one other thing. If you're not so concerned about creating the best quality compost, but instead want to focus on making hot water for showers, you can run a black plastic tubing through the pile and get the pile to get up to those really high temperatures and you can have hot water for, for weeks. When a client approaches us about having a master plan done for their project, we go through a whole series of steps to make that happen. We start generally with a goals analysis of of their site, of their family, of their project, of their enterprise that they're, they're wanting us to work on. Um, after that, we generally do a site analysis. We'll do a visit to the site, spend a number of days, up to a week with the client, um, establishing what are the pre-existing structures on site, what resources are available to the, to the project, and what might be useful um, in terms of moving forward with the design. You're gonna put in topsoil. So that way we obviously won't lust vegetation, gardenings and around uh, landscaping. But at that point, I think, yeah, you need to just lay out where you're gonna be. I think you can get 10 or 12 of uh, the bungalows. So this is there. a great way to make, create shade really fast and get a, something delicious from it. If we put the dirt up too high, then in dry season, the water table can drop so far that whatever you plant, it dies. I think it's just watching the water that flows. After that, we, we go back to the drawing board we start scratching ideas, working with each other, working with the team of designers, and figuring out what is the most appropriate set of strategies and techniques which might bring about achieving the goals for, for this family, for this enterprise, for this project. Okay, to protect against that, so that's something we've already learned. It can be a lesson learned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a direct resource from the local community right yeah. here. So every single bot is going to those people that worked for it. But they didn't buy anything at Tesco Lotus to, yeah. to be able to supply those materials, which is nice. Yeah, that's what we want to support. Ultimately, with the master plan, what we're looking for is to achieve our holistic goals. We want the economics of the site to be in line, we want the ecology of the site to be continuously improving, and we want the personal needs of the residents there to be met. In the fields behind me, we're implementing a combination of orchard, food forest, and alley cropping corn systems over here. One of the first steps we're gonna go in to do with this is to put in swales. About 600 meters of swales, three contoured lines of swales we put in behind me in the, in the coming months. Now those swales primarily are intended to sink in all the water that falls during the rainy season and benefit the land throughout the year. That water will penetrate the soil and be held down in the water table and be accessible to the plants uh, throughout the year. The benefits of the infiltration of water from the swale system will be felt on this land and beyond. Additional water into the water tables and accessible water to all the plants on site will bring a lot more greenery to this land throughout the dry season.
It's just incredible to see the amount of growth that's taken place in a short nine month period here. I mean, this was just cornfields uh, nine months ago. Uh, I'm surrounded by a sea of legume trees, fixing nitrogen, creating shade, and even providing food for the community here. Uh, this plant here is a pigeon pea. It's one of a permaculture all-stars in the tropical climate. Um, we can eat the shoots uh, off the plant, we can eat the seeds off the plant, and all the while it's fixing nitrogen. There's edibles around me, there's young fruit trees around me, and uh, basically for as far as I can see on this land is a water harvesting swale that over the course of the last nine months has probably harvested in the area of 20 million liters of water. Perfect. Through the implementation of these enhancement strategies, we're looking to reduce erosion, to build healthier soil, to increase yields, and in turn, make it more profitable for the farmers here. Ever since I discovered this pile a couple of days ago, we find ourselves returning here often, mostly because it has the most dense microbial life of any soil on the farm. Yeah, that's true. It's a wonderful resource for microbes, especially here. They're starting, you know, a new farm and they need to build soil to really improve soil fertility. And we would expect that this pile has the best microbial life because it provides the best environment on the farm for those microbes. It has all the food that these microbes need mm -hmm. and the, the cover on top is protecting it from the sun and holding the moisture inside. So the microbes in here have everything they need to be growing and flourishing and they haven't really touched this pile in two years, mm -hmm. so it hasn't been turned like the agricultural fields, so there's no disturbance for the microbes, so they can just grow freely. We were invited here to teach about the soils and set up a basic soil biology lab, which is really exciting for us because the soils are something that nobody really even talks about or understands, and it's just so important because there's so much life underneath the soil. In one teaspoon of good, healthy soil, there are over one billion bacteria, 900 feet of fungi, 50,000 protozoa, and several dozen nematodes. It, it, it's feeding the plant, right? So we always this idea that we need the nitrogen and the fertilizers to feed the plant to make them grow. But for millennia, Mother Nature has been feeding the plants and making everything on Earth grow without our input. And it's these soil microbes which do that. The plants have a relationship with the soil microbes, which allows them to obtain all the nutrients that the plants need in the soil. The microbes help produce good soil structure. They cycle various nutrients, such as nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. They interact with each other at the root zone of the plant and provide all the nutrition the plant needs. So we all know that the, the, that the plant undergoes photosynthesis. Like the sun hits it, there's the, the chloroplast, it creates these sugars, and we all think that's what it uses to make itself grow. But really a plant is taking more than half of that, like 60% of every, all the energy that it, that, it, that it grows, that it makes from the sun, and it's feeding it through these root exudates to the microorganisms in the soil. These little guys, these, these fungi, these bacteria, they can't photosynthesize, so they uh, rely on the plant to get all the food that it needs, but there's a little trade going on here. So in exchange for the sugars that the plant is giving it, the soil microbes are providing the food that the plant needs to grow. It's really important to understand the difference between an orchard and a, and a food forest. Uh, an orchard is a kind of less intensively managed area. Usually it's larger in size and focuses on one or two species, with the whole purpose being high production of those one or two species to, to send to market. Uh, food forest is a, uh, usually in much smaller in area, a little bit more intensively managed. Um, it's, it has multi-functions, it has many more functions than the orchard does. So once this food forest is finished, we hope to have mimic many of the layers of the, of the forest, of a natural forest, including the trees, shrubs, herbs, and vine layers. What we're actually doing here right now is trying to take the orchard and turn it into a food forest. We've actively tilled this land and we're gonna, we're gonna alley crop in the meantime until these trees get quite a bit bigger. And currently we're adding in different herbs and vegetables to the understory of the trees. Right now, they're planting um, cassava cuttings. 
Cassava is a pretty incredible plant in that it's so versatile in the tropics. It can grow in a desert situation, it can grow in a really wet situation. It's not the most nutritious food item, but it is a security plant. Um, we look at it, if there is some sort of emergency, if there's a huge drought or if there's a, uh, a hurricane that wipes out all the fruit crops off the trees, we can still dig up these giant roots of cassava and get the, the needed calories. One of the features that's missing from this orchard, one of the an important feature to transition it into food forests is the addition of legumes. Uh, legumes are a classification of plant that the vast majority of them fix nitrogen into the soil. It's really important through a um, interaction with bacteria in the soil, the bacteria is able to pull nitrogen out of the air and add it into the soil. This is a huge boon for us. Some of the important species that we're gonna use in the legume family are um, Gliracidia. Gliracidia is a really great uh, tropical legume in that you can plant it by cuttings. Very similar to the cassava cuttings back here, you can just chop it into little one foot lengths. And as long as you plant it the right way up, it will grow. Another great one is Leucina. Leucina grows around here really commonly. Um, some of the Thai people consider it somewhat of a pest, but the multiple functions of Leucina make it well worth planting it out here. It's a fodder for animals. It fixes nitrogen in the soil. It's a great chop and drop uh, nitrogen fixing plant because you chop it in, during the rainy season, chop it up in little bits, put it around these fruit trees, and by just a few months later, the sprouts are growing big again. And by the dry season, it's putting up, a, putting up enough shade to to keep these trees uh, healthy and happy. A uh, third great um, nitrogen fixing plant, which we're actually planting today, is pigeon pea. I can't wait to just be able to come out here and pick my own jackfruits and durians and star apples and uh, jujubes and atamoyas, soursops, and jackfruits, uh, oranges, pomelos, pineapples on the ground, Jamaican cherry, and oh, Durian season comes around, it's gonna be so good. Low quads and Suriname cherries, mango steens, the queen of fruit, lychee and mangoes. Okay, beautiful. So I was sitting in this little shop here in the village of Hui Katang Thai and uh, having a beer with a couple locals and a couple people from the farm. Kind of talking about um, how we're going to plant the food forest, you know, what species we're going to put in, what different layers we can achieve, and um, trying to strategize about how exactly to get it going. And I, I raised my eyes up and looked, was looking out in the yard while I was thinking, and all of a sudden I'm like, huh? They got a food forest growing right here in the yard. So it's really beautiful. We should walk out there. Yeah. 
After a little bit closer examination of, the, of this woman's yard, I can identify at least 12 varieties of edible, almost all perennials that are existing in this, in this backyard food forest. Straight behind me here is an overstory of this area is the jackfruit tree. A tree that produces more fruit in terms of kilos per year than any other fruit on the planet. Beyond the jackfruit tree, which is actually in a neighbor's yard, you can see what they call Gruy Hom in Thai, which is the kind of western style banana that's the big long ones. Um, there's actually jackfruits on the tree. I can see about 10 of them just in the, in the lower branches. And as we come closer here, we got papaya growing. It's a nice Thai, thai papaya. Um, also, as we start to walk around this garden, there's a couple different varieties of eggplants. Here's the Thai style eggplant, the little round version. And right here, a little closer, are the longer versions, a little bit closer to the Western style. These ones have gone beyond eating, uh, beyond the best point for eating, but they can be still saved for seeds. This is lemongrass. I'm sure it's used almost every day in the, in the family's cooking. There's more of the traditional Thai banana behind us. There's actually a couple small bunches of them. They're kind of like the little ladyfinger style bananas, much smaller, much more flavorful than the bananas we have in the West. You can see beyond these little papayas here, you can see a little bunch of bananas up in the tree there. And as we pan around that way, we've got the um, kaffir lime. This plant is used often in Thai cooking in the um, in the coconut milk soup, they use this and they, they often fry it with peanuts and other things. Really amazing, um, delicious herb. And kind of in the, on the ground here, in the wetter area in the yard, this wet loving plant called pandanus, which is used often in, um, it's this plant here. It's used often in uh, desserts and herbal drinks in Thailand. Some others hanging from the tree up here. They look like little small perennial cucumbers on it that you can eat, but what's most often eaten in Thailand is just the shoots off of this plant. So I don't know how many I just named, but there's close to 12. And another one, which I saw popping up over in the corner over there, which I don't even think they planted, was some amaranth. Probably just a weed for this family, but uh, totally pickable and edible in their stir fries. Beautiful. If we can get our food forest to look half as good, we're, we're golden. So we've looked at how a food forest is made, and if you haven't got enough space for a forest, you can always make a garden in your backyard. So when people think of gardening, they might think of food, maybe soil, maybe even hard work. But for me, when I think of gardening, I think empowerment, because my garden is a little mini revolution in itself. It's a way for us to work from the grassroots and really cut the ties between this big business and agribusiness, which causes all this environmental degradation. And if every dollar that I'm spending is saying, I support you, then I'm just not willing to support super supermarket chains. So it also it means a lot about nutrition for me as well. Um, when I searched the world for what was the healthiest thing in, to put into my body and I read and read and I found in every book it always went back to the healthiest thing you can eat is something that's picked directly from a plant and put directly into your mouth. And this is like healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy humans. It's also really cheap. You know, you can grow a lot of food in a very small area for not much money. Pharmaceutical companies use uh, the gardens, the herbs and spices and the root plants that are growing right in our garden beds. They put loads of chemicals in and do lose loads of fossil fuels and then sell it to us where we've got it growing in our own garden beds. So let's just cut that tie all together. So if we're thinking about gardens, we can think cheap, we can think easy, you can meet your neighbours, you can meet your local community by learning from the garden and learning from your, your surroundings. Um, and it's fun. <laughs> it's so much fun to garden. Watching things grow can be really beautiful. So here in the tropics, there's a few really good strategies that you can use in your garden. Um, one would be mulch. A lot of the um, 
everything's kept in the biomass in, in the tropics. So we need to cover our soil with as much organic matter as you can. And that can be straw or you can grow your own mulch, lemongrass or comfrey, throw anything onto the soil as long as it's covered. Um, another one would be uh, water. So when we're facing the wet and dry season of the tropics, we have to really design around our water systems. So one good water strategy in the tropics is using swales or planting on contour, like Jeff I was speaking about. Another good strategy is using drip line irrigation, which you would place underneath the mulch and that waters the, the plant exactly, because we're trying to reduce, reuse and recycle as much water as we can. Um, so you can also use things like grey water. That's a really good use of grey water is into your garden beds. Another good strategy in tropical um, gardening is weed barriers. So in the tropics we have huge bursts of growth in the wet season. And they're just, they're all there for a reason. In permaculture we think the problem is the solution. So we look at a weed and try and work out how can that be our solution. Um, and a lot of weeds are doing the things that we want them to do. They're covering the soil and protecting it, which gives us the, the amazing plants. So covering the soil would be the, one, the first thing that you would do when you're trying to stop the weeds coming up. So that comes back to mulch again. That cuts down a lot of, of our weeding needs. And you can also plant weed barriers. So plant, put things around the edges of your garden that can um, stop the weeds from, from coming in. Um, that can be logs or bricks or rocks or anything. Um, or you can plant, plant weed barriers and that way you've got gut, uh, veg and things growing around the, the edge of your garden that you can harvest from as well. Things like comfrey, again lemongrass, canna lilies, day lilies, edible flowers, plant them around the edges of your garden and you're going to have extra things to harvest from and stop the weeds. <laughs> so there's a couple of permaculture plants that I love to use in the tropics. Um, one is comfrey. Comfrey is one of my favourites. Um, it's an amazing, amazing plant. It can do so many things, as I said before, with the weed barriers. It's really good. It grows in a big clump, so it stops any weeds from coming in. It's also what we call a dynamic accumulator. So it sends tap roots really deep down in the soil and pulls out loads of nutrients that aren't accessible to other plants. And it stores them in really concentrated forms in the leaves. Then when the, leaves, when the plant dies down in the, the, over the season, the nutrients become accessible to all the plants around. Um, so that's really super good for the plants. And because it has so, so high nutrients in the leaves, it's really good for making weed teas. So you just ferment it in water and then spray that over your garden, diluted, and it's just like a little fertilizer. Um, you can also use it as a compost accelerator. Um, if you put it in your compost, it makes it go way faster. Even just a few leaves does the trick. It's also a medicinal plant. They call it nip bone in some places. The Roman soldiers never used to march in, uh, in war unless they had comfrey and garlic. They were the two antiseptic, antibacterial, anti-amazingness of plants. <laughs> um, the other really good plant that we use a lot in tropical permaculture is neem. And this is a really good pioneer plant. The Christian probably spoke a bit in the food forest about plants that, that pioneer up. Um, it's a really fast growing tree and it's also very medicinal. The Indians eat like five leaves a day. A neem leaf a day keeps the doctor away. It's really bitter, but amazing for every part of your body. Building immunity, immune system, it's really good for digestion. Um, you can even use the branches to brush your teeth with. There's oil. You can get oil from the leaves and from the, the um, fruit. And from that you can use, make shampoos and you can make detergents. And it gets rid of things like lice and fleas. So it's excellent for your animals too. Um, and because it's uh, so, such a bitter leaf, it's really good insecticide, a natural insecticide. So you can turn it into a spray and keep all the bugs away. And because of that, you can also use it as a mulch on your garden and that prevents pests and things from coming into your garden as well. So both of these plants are my favorite. Grey water is something that we can utilise to the extreme. There's so many nutrients and amazing things that come from grey water. Um, and grey water is anything that comes from your kitchen sink, your shower, your bathroom sink, and black water comes from your toilet. From your kitchen, you put a grease trap and then directly into your banana circle. So you can be washing your plates in the evening time and watering your banana circle, which is right at your door. And banana circle is a really beautiful way of um, um, using tropical permaculture. To make a banana circle, you basically dig a, a mulch pit, fill that with mulch, organic matter, cardboard, newspaper, rice husk, anything that can um, de decompose down and feed the microbes and the worms below. Then you plant bananas around the outside and of the circle and they, those grow down and their roots form like a net underneath 
and that holds the whole thing together and supports it in a really um, beautiful structured way. Then from there we add loads of gills. We stack in the, the amazing plants so we can, we can plant papayas or mulberries or coconuts all amongst there and then we can plant ground covers of sweet potato and taro and yams. We can plant beans to climb up and support the, the papayas. So we can make these a really amazing abundant systems of, perm of um, tropical permaculture that is like ecosystems within itself. So a great way to take that even one step further is to cut the distance between the house and the banana circle by actually creating a banana circle shower. So you can grow your stand in amongst your amazing ecosystem of food and shower directly underneath this beautiful banana circle, knowing that the water that you pour on yourself is feeding directly down into the plants beneath you, which is then feeding you. So we can create these beautiful ecosystems of microclimates right at our doorstep, really, with a, for a crazy amount of abundance. Out here in the fields amongst the fruit trees and the taking soil samples and things, it's easy to kind of forget about money and not think about it. But money is an important part of our lives. Um, when we consider money and profit and economic yield on a permaculture site, we have to look at it from a couple different angles. Uh, the, we don't separate necessarily the enterprise of the family from the family life itself. So we can look at uh, a reduction in costs to the family life similarly to an, to an increase in profits from enterprise. Um, so what we're trying to do with permaculture systems here is both to reduce our costs, to reduce our fuel usage, to reduce the cost of all the implements and machinery that we need on site, to reduce the cost of labor, to reduce all our inputs like pesticides, fertilizers, those kind of things, reduce them down very low, while at the same time producing a product that's of higher quality. The organic and permaculture grown uh, produce can get a much higher cost in the market. We can seek out niche markets, we can approach restaurants, we can approach hotels, we can approach uh, CSA, community supported agriculture products and see if our, um, if our product can be sold through those avenues. resources we have on site can be used in different ways and when one stops being useful in one way it can be turned into something else for example not far from me over here is a row of jackfruit trees a healthy mature tree can easily produce over 500 kilograms of fruit in a year that jackfruit tree can live to 800 years old and at the end of its 800 year life it's a high quality timber that timber that can be then be cut down and put into put into a house that will last multiple generations when that house is ready to come down and the wood starts to rot out, that wood can be pulled, pulled down and made into a chair, made into a piece of furniture. And when that, when that chair starts to fall apart, that wood can then be used as kindling in the fire. And then when that fire is out, we can take the ash from that, put that ash in our compost pile, and mix it back into our gardens and grow another jackfruit tree with it. So this is the way we want to think in permaculture. It's all like inside of us, it's inside of us. It's only been over the last like 50, 60 years that we've lost this knowledge, you know? It's inside of us and I teach it and then I see that people so fast, they learn so fast, they enjoy it so much as they go. And I really do think that it's only over the last 50 or 60 years that it's been lost. Before that, you know, my grandfather, he built his own house at the weekends whilst having a job during the week. And, yeah. I think people have a fear about it. They have a fear that they need to employ someone to do it for them, that they can't do it themselves, that we're told that we can't do it ourselves. And it's really not the case, you know, we can. And if you put your own energy into it, it becomes something different, you know, you've invested, it's like, it becomes like a piece of art, you've invested a piece of yourself in it, so it has so much more, you enjoy it so much more. Right back the 
just wrong having it on the ball. Oh, okay. keep it so this is it a difference, yeah. This is, this is like the big one. This one is still a rover ball and I'm screaming back there. So it's still the large one. Yeah, fill them all. Keeping the buckets clean as we come back. There are many styles of natural building, and the one that we choose depends on the local context, it depends on the local materials available. Permaculture tries to draw from local, traditional and indigenous knowledge and combine that with modern and appropriate technology. Concrete or cement has its place in natural building, but from permaculture point of view, we want to use it very mindfully and in the right places and the minimum possible. And it's very different working with adobe as opposed to concrete or cement, which is a destructive system. And in permaculture, we're looking to move away from supporting destructive systems. The style that we're chosen for this building is adobe. Adobe's been used for thousands of years. It's available to all. It's the earth underneath our feet. It's fun to do, and it can, it, it can be done by anybody. We don't want more than 30% clay in the mix. The majority of the mix is a sand or some kind of binder. But you can use coconut fiber or animal hair or chopped straw. So we can see the people behind me here, they're adding water to the pit. So we want to get the water proportions correct so there's not too much water. If there's too much, when we lift the forms, the bricks are going to slump. And if there's not enough, it will have trouble lifting the forms up. A lot of people tend to put too much clay into their bricks. And if there's too much clay, they can crack, they'll come apart and crack because the clay will expand when wet and contract when dry. We dry it out in the sun and it will go very hard and make a solid brick to use. We don't want the bricks to dry out too fast. We put straw over them so they dry nice and slowly. In this case, we're using shade cloth that we'll later use on our nursery on site. When working with natural materials, we don't need to use much safety gear because it's very kind to us. As opposed to working with concrete or cement, we need gloves. If we don't, if we spend all day working with cement, we're going to have blisters the next day and our hands are going to dry out. Working with the earth, it's beautiful, it feels so natural. Here in the tropics, we want to design towards staying cool and dry, and also thinking about rains. A lot of this will relate to the roof design. So we want big overhangs on our roofs to protect our walls from the rain and the elements. Also, it multifunctions and it shades our walls to keep the interior of the house cool. We want to have openings in the roof so the air can flow through the house and create updrafts, which keeps the house nice and cool. Maintenance has to be done after the monsoon season here in the tropics. And that could be replastering a wall or often putting another lime wash on to protect from the rains and also to patch up some damage that may have been caused by the strong winds and rains that we get during that time of year. And it can be done together with a family or a group of friends and it can be an enjoyable experience. But some maintenance is always necessary.
projects here within the community we're really excited about is the earthen baking oven. Earthen ovens really bring community together. They bring people together. It connects us with our food source. It connects us with the, the elements of the earth. You know, when we've built this oven using the resources around us, using clay and sand, so this oven is being built not only to give the students an introduction to natural building and a first-hand experience of working with the materials and the resources that are just right outside of our door, they're all around us, but um, also because we are so excited to be baking bread and making pizzas and roasting a turkey that we've raised on the farm here. We're putting our oven here on this, um, in this area that will become a really beautiful kind of garden patio, a sitting area for people to come together and relax and rejuvenate and have good conversation and prepare food. And it's gonna be a gathering place for celebration. Uh, it's gonna be surrounded by gardens and um, edible foods. You can go out and you can pick the herbs that you're gonna be putting in your bread or on your pizza. Um, and, and so it's gonna just create a really beautiful space. Earth ovens are also super heat efficient, using all three types of heat, being radiant heat from the sun, convectional heat, which is warm, warm air circulating through, and conductive heat, like frying an egg on a frying pan. Most conventional modern ovens use only one type of heat, being convectional heat. And, um, that can leave a lot of air pockets, cool air pockets, and so you don't get a, as even of a baking. Um, with the earthen oven, you have the radiant heat being stored in the earthen, thick earthen walls going back into the oven. Um, we also have a thermal layer, an insulative layer, so that heat is not lost to the outside. The heat, the heat goes back into the center of the oven. Um, inside, the warm air is circulating. It's really steam-filled air, so you so you get this moist baking environment that really creates nice loaves of bread. And then you also get the conductive heat from the fire being built right on the bricks. And the bricks warm up to such a hot temperature that the bread or the pizza or the turkey is roasted, is baking from below. So these three types of heat um, create a really even, efficient environment for whatever you may be baking. A step I really like to do is prep all my materials. A lot of times we're getting our clay from big piles or excavation sites or holes we've dug, and it might have chunks, clay clods in it, or stones or pebbles. And working with sifted material is so much nicer. And you're gonna get a better product because you're not gonna get air pockets and, and rock pockets where he can get in and kind of burst burst open the area. Um, sand is also a good thing to sift. A lot of sand has rock chunks in it. So um, sifted material is great and a really nice step to include. So when it gets to be like you're happy with all the seams and the evenness, we're just going to let it sit. Don't go over it too much. And I know I repeat that, but it's so easy just to keep going over and over. But it's really detrimental for the it's good for the clay. And remember, your oven is your own artistic, creative expression, so make it beautiful and put a lot of love into it. Permaculture is about an assembly of elements about how elements fit together and how they relate to one another. And one of the most important elements in any permaculture design is how the community fits into the design work. So today we have a very unique opportunity to incorporate elements in a community that we've never had before. Um, through the internet and um, just living in uh, large cities, we're able to find people uh, of like minds and assemble communities uh, much more dynamically than we ever have been able to before. I teach her Christian 
um, kind of send an email out inviting some of his previous students to this new project, um, which we didn't have a name for at the time. Uh, but I jumped on it. Um, I was at home at the time and couldn't really handle the idea of staying in the developed world with intelligent people and watching all the problems with, and no solutions <laughs> in sight. So came here to learn what I could learn and I've been here for 11 months now. About two years ago, I was still uh, in my final term of high school and um, the project I gave myself was um, an in-depth study into Native Americans uh, because I've always loved them in, in terms of like the way that they were part of nature. It sounded amazing to me and it sounded like a fairy tale. Um, but anyways, I did all the research that I could on it. I read so many books on it and I ended up wanting to study all aspects of the culture and actually try implementing like the way they built shelters and the way they made fire without matches and that kind of thing. Uh, and I started with fire and ended up spending the whole month trying to make fire without matches. Um, but the point of that is, is that I had like a very deep passion for like these indigenous people who were around before, um, you know, technology and all that. Not that technology is evil. I'm not. I'm not one of those people. But it's just there's still something very beautiful to me about that ancient lifestyle. Um, if I reflect about on that time now, two years later, it's pretty amazing to think about the kind of things that I've learned just by being here and living and just, it's a very real experience. There's, and before when I was reading these books and it was all very um, fantastical and it seemed like this dream that I could never achieve while I was living in a prep school dormitory, you know, in St. Louis, Missouri, it all seemed so far out of my reach. And in just two short years, I'm, here. As an example, this community here, um, I've been here now for about a little over a month. Um, and I see this as one of those opportunities. Kind of the age old problem in society now, and people working their life away for retirement, and then they realize they work their, their life, life away for retirement. <laughs> it's uh, not a very healthy way to live. And it's very easy to avoid it if you just accept that you can't really control time and time controls you more and you have to work with it and just, yeah, just accept it. And, uh... We've been here now eight days, somewhere around there, and uh, the transition has been huge for me personally. Uh, so much so that I almost can't remember what was going through my head eight days ago. Uh, I know that for me as a nurse and, and traveling around the world and, and seeing what we're doing, not only to ourselves, but the planet is has been almost overwhelming to the point I've been stuck, kind of, uh, not able to move forward, not even really sure what direction I want to go in, um, and really pretty bummed out and depressed about it, traveling to places to provide health care to people and realizing that corporations got their head of me and they're drinking soda and their teeth are rotting out in the middle of the Amazon. I mean, it's it's been a crippling feeling. And so uh, to come here and in eight days lose a feeling that I've had for 15 years is, that's pretty mind-blowing, actually. Um, I feel empowered. I feel like I can take the knowledge that we've learned and go back to these places I'm so passionate about going and working with the Maasai and giving them the tools that I've been given. And it didn't take that long. I mean, obviously, I, I don't have any as much practical experience as I need, but the knowledge is there now. And I'm really, really excited not to feel terrible. And I'm really excited to actually feel like really positive change is possible without that much effort. I think there are many great examples of this kind of work happening all across the world today. Um, personally, where I'm from, uh, Austin, Texas, I've seen amazing changes and development within the community there. Um, in just a short uh, six months, uh, I 
I've witnessed one neighborhood go from um, a lot of skepticism, drug and gang violence to a exciting and um, revolutionary kind of development where people were coming out into their front yards and uh, sharing um, food that they had made and food that they had grown and um, contributing and taking part in uh, the development of their community. And within that same time frame, those elements that were destabilizing the community um, literally went away on their own accord. I just thought, like, how can I make this happen? And so I, um, I'm starting with food. I just really like good produce. And um, so I started looking into how to grow your own food very, in a very efficient way. That's where I uh, came across permaculture. Permaculture is pretty much everything, I would say. It's just, it's just about life. So I cannot just looking at having good food. I have to look at everything to be fulfilled in life. Permaculture also includes community. So that conquers the next part. I want to create something nice for everybody that everybody can benefit from. Instead of trying to focus on a career that's just about me, but not about anybody else. Where I'm gonna end up, I don't know. But that's, that's the beauty of it, just being in the moment and just stop trying to control, just work with everything around you. That's, uh, you, can't have, you can't force anything. You can try to force things, um, but you're just gonna create the opposite. All of our mistakes, all of the, the great things we've done, with all the mistakes we've made, it's just been part of the process, and I don't regret any of it for a second, because I know I've learned a lot more from mistakes than from doing things the right way. Everything's connected, and everything's an opportunity to, to improve and to grow and to be better. We live in a very exciting time, and we have a lot of opportunities available to us to share and uh, contribute to a healthy and sustainable world. And we're going to be able to do that best through assembling communities that work together. That's what a lot of it is about, is building and creating fertile ground for community to establish itself. And through that process, permaculture and these other elements that we talk about within permaculture design can begin to establish themselves.
What is the life that I want to live? How do I want it to look? How do I want to relate to the people around me? How do I want to spend my time and spend my days? What do I want included in my daily, monthly, yearly set of activities? For me personally, I want a life that's socially engaged. I want a life that's full of really amazing, wonderful relationships. I want to be able to express my love on a daily basis. I want time to be able to play my guitar. I want time to be able to sit in the morning and have silence. This is what I want in my life. I'm going to use permaculture ideas, permaculture principles to design around this to create that lifestyle. I look at our society in general and really confused by the choices that people are making. It's kind of the normal choices to make, but they don't make any sense to me. I, I really wonder, are these the choices that we'd really make if we are really designing our own lives? Each of us, I believe, can sit down and think clearly about what we want in the world. I've got a new permaculture principle I'd like to add to the permaculture community, to add to the list of principles. It's a principle that I've discovered over the years of traveling around uh, my time in a number of different projects around the planet, and I think it's really important for all of us to bring it in. I think, actually, that most of us have experienced it, just like all the other permaculture principles. And from what I've experienced in my life, if the area around me is beautiful, if things are put away, if we keep things clean, if there's some beautiful flowers, if the gardens are nice, then my life is more wonderful. I also see that when people come and visit the farm and want to learn about permaculture, they see that also, if it's beautiful, it's better. Mm -hmm.